Do you manage your own IT for distributed teams in Asia? You know how painful it is. Asseval helps your in-house team by taking tough tasks off their hands and giving them the tools to manage IT effectively. Get help across eight countries in Asia Pacific, which includes onboarding, procurement, device management, real-time IT support, offboarding, and more. Gain full control of all your IT infrastructure in one place with our state-of-the-art platform. Check out Esevel, E-S-E-V-E-L dot com and get a demo today. Use our referral code BRAVE for three months free. Terms and conditions apply. The conclusion I've come to, and I think the academic research shows this, is that a well-run accelerator does make a difference, but possibly one of the ways it makes a difference is actually in attracting great talent. In other words, it's the aggregation of great talent and the community you build around an accelerator that may be more important than any kind of process. So there isn't a magic selection process to pick out winners, and we can talk about that if you want. And there isn't a magic process for ensuring success either. If you think of trying to get chemical reactions to happen, you kind of put some molecules in a box and shake it and try and bang them into each other. Welcome to Brave. Learn from Southeast Asia's best tech leaders. Build the future, learn from our past, and stay human in between. No BS on success. I'm Jeremy Al, venture capitalist, serial founder, Harvard MBA, sci-fi nerd, and dad of two daughters. Mondays for your weekly tech news debate with Shi Yen Ko, managing partner of Hustle Fund. Wednesdays for interviews of regional changemakers covering both the highs and lows of leadership. Fridays for personal diary insights and listener questions and answers. Join our movement of over 12,000 members for transcripts, analysis, and community at www.bravesea.com. Hey, Hugh. Really Thanks. excited to have you on the show. You have been a great leader and a lot of people look up to you as a great mentor. So I'm really excited to dive into your origin story and your grand adventures. Thank you. What a nice thing to say. I think I'll come on with your podcast again. <laughs> Definitely. 100%. So uh, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. So I started my career as an engineer, became a TV producer. My first business was a TV production company. I was invited to come to Singapore in 2006 to help build the media sector, but I ended up working with a lot of people and doing some stuff towards startups. And uh, I'm a dad. And uh, yeah, I guess my friends call me an Ungmo Korean, which I think is a compliment. Half Singaporean, half Ungmo. Amazing. That's definitely an advanced level term there. Even harder yeah, than burn uh, rate. I should say to cost. you, this, this episode is brought to you, sponsored by African Sea Coconut Cough Mixture. I know we both got coughs. And you'll also hear the official sound of an HDB here in Red Hill. We did, I should say for listeners, we did conspire before this to try and see whether we would try and con everyone that we were actually meeting around a campfire in the middle of a jungle with like a storm going on to make it really authentic. If you do hear the lightning crashing, it isn't some kind of cheesy effect. It is actually the real thing. Well, if we're in luck, then we'll have the storm come in at a very opportune mo dramatic yeah, moment. Yeah, that's a bit of ads, right? yeah. And so I think a lot of folks remember you really as JFDI, right? The Joyful Fraud Digital Incubator. And actually, my sister <laughs> did one of her first jobs at your place, which is she how did. I first she, got to hear about you. Yeah, yeah. she was fantastic. Yeah. Mm. So I got to ask, how did you get into that space, right? Because startups, I would say like technology scene has, is less than 10 years old across Southeast Asia. And there you were very much at the beginning, right? Yeah, and I think, I mean, I, I think Meng... Meng Wong, my co-founder, and I would both say we just happened to be the right guys in the right place at the right time. The, what happened was with a bunch of younger local people here, we set up the first co-working space in Singapore, which was Hacker Space in Kampong Glam. Still running, I think, but now in Geylang. And we've been running that for about nine months, and it just turned into a kind of a riot. There was like parties every night. We were having to kind of having to kick people out at 2 a.m. It was just fantastic. Like all the world's geeks would come through Singapore and stopovers and all the local geeks would be kind of attractive. Then we just had a complete geek out time. So that was really great. And about December in 2010, I think, let me get this right. Yeah, 2010 or 2011, I forget now. But the, one of the first Echelon conferences happened here. That was Mohan, I think, wasn't it? With, the, with Echelon, was that right? 
And it was like 50 people in a borrowed room in SMU, I seem to remember. And one of them, the kind of star guest speaker, the government had paid to fly over this guy called David Cohen, who'd set up this thing called Techstars in Boulder, Colorado. And he was very inspiring. And, and about February the next year, he called me up one day and he just randomly said, hey, Hugh, you know, the Singapore government wants me to come to Singapore and do Techstars in Singapore. And I've got a young family and a bunch of other things I want to do. And you guys seem to be quite connected to the community. So why don't you do it? And Meng and I looked at each other and thought, actually, that's a really interesting idea. Nobody, to our knowledge, has done an accelerator in, in Asia before. We didn't know, actually, there were two or three others starting. There was one starting in Australia and there was one starting in India. But it took us about 18 months to get the money together to do this first accelerator in Southeast Asia. Um, and then it took us about five years to figure out what we were actually doing. It was the fourth day of Chinese New Year in, in I don't know which year, Chinese year it would have been, which animal. But it was 2012. And the reason we started on the fourth day was because the senior lady at Singtel, our sponsors, Yvonne Quick, said it was very inauspicious to meet new people on the third. And then later in that week, we had the whole, you know, the lion dance and everything else to kind of bring auspiciousness and prosperity and wealth to our startups. But I do remember looking around these guys thinking, wow, you put your trust in us. We've No one's ever done this in Asia before. And I thought we'd better make it work. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, we knew that there was a bunch of stuff which had worked for tech stars in Boulder, Colorado. And we figured out what was interesting about that was, I mean, I think if I get the dates right, I think Y Combinator started 20, 2006. And I think tech stars was 2007, if I'm correct, that's the right years. And why Combinator is a very special thing, still is. It's in a very special place. Singapore is a special place. But we thought to ourselves, well, if Techstars can make it work in Boulder, which is basically a university town, you might know, with about 100,000 people, most of whom are old and very rich, and a bunch of students and a nice mountain. We thought, well, if they can make it work there, then we can probably make it work in Singapore. So we thought we'd give it a go. And I'm very grateful to, to the investors who backed us and the sponsors too. Couldn't have done it without them. And yeah, I always remember that I was like, oh, you're joining the GFDI and what does GFDI mean? And apparently it does not mean Joyful Frog Digital Incubator. <laughs> well, there's a little bit more about that story. Yeah. yeah. So if anyone hasn't heard the story before, what happened was we were trying to think of a name for the business and we came up with like JFDI, which you might know in the West stands for just effing do it. And we thought, well, that's a great spirit of entrepreneurship thing. So the first test, we thought, well, let's see if Acro, the, the company name registry here in Singapore, let's see if they let us have JFDI. And they did. And then we said to ourselves, well, if we're going to tell people that we're going to help them raise money in 100 days for their startup, then we have to raise money in 100 days. Right? Otherwise, we're totally bogus. And on day 94, we got an offer from a government-linked fund. And we thought to ourselves, they're going to ask us tomorrow at this meeting, right? Well, what does JFDI stand for? And we've been for dinner in Geylang, which for those who are listening from overseas, you may not know, it's the kind of the official red light area of Singapore. So it's full of exciting nightlife. And one of the interesting things, it's also full of great food. And there's a fantastic shop there. There's a choo-choo frog porridge shop called the Eminent Frog Porridge Shop, which is very famous. And as we drove past, it just popped into my head. And I thought, oh, I said to me, let's tell them it stands for Joyful Frog Digital Incubator. Like one of those weird four character Chinese phrases that all the kids have to learn at school here. And then we got some friends who were Chinese scholars to translate JFDI into Chinese characters. And I, I can't remember the exact translation, but it stands for something like eminent tadpole helping organization or something. And the, and the actual characters sort of sound like JFDI. It was a very clever translation by someone. So people who actually know Chinese who look at our logo, they go, oh, very wise, very wise. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, after a while, we discovered that it was a very appropriate name for an accelerator. I mean, first of all, when we were talking about the business model just now, if you're going to invest in startups, I'm sure you've experienced this too, Jeremy, you've got to spawn a lot of tadpoles and you know that most of them are going to die. I think most people would say with a venture fund, even not later stage investment than we were doing, even with a venture fund in a, in out of 10 investments, you're probably going to get one or two hits. If you're lucky, that's what's going to return the fund. The rest, unfortunately, you're not going to make it. And if you invest earlier than the VC stage, if you're investing as we were pre-seed, whoa, you are, there's the dramatic rumble. If you're investing pre-seed, the hit rate is going to be much lower. And later on, 500 startups set up Dave McClure's original organization. And their, their philosophy was basically, look, this is a numbers game. We need to back a big portfolio and, and, and one or two will make it. And that's been true for us. It's been fascinating, actually. Now, 10 years on, we can see some results. And I appreciate we're skipping forwards and backwards in time here, but if you actually look at the numbers for Y Combinator and you look at the numbers for Techstars and you look at the numbers for every other accelerator that's worked in scale, we've done pretty much as well or as badly as all of them. 
So out of our 70 startups, 50% made it to seized investment. So in Singapore at the time, that was about 300, 500 US thousand dollars. And then of those seed funded startups, about 20% went on to make it to series A. So the total a number of sort of, and then, and then some of those have, have really grown. So out of the entire portfolio of 70 that we invested in, we might have one possible unicorn that's silent eight. It's, it's, it's doing extremely well. We also have Glints, which I know your firm put money into too. So thank you very much to yourself and Ong Peng Sin for taking over the reins and helping those guys. Fantastic team. And so out of the total portfolio of 70, I suppose there's about five or six hits. We've had about two or three significant exits already. So, you know, that's my son's education paid for, which is great. And a lot of jobs created and a lot of fun had. But I think it is, I mean, the conclusion I've come to, and I think the academic research shows this, is that a well-run accelerator does make a difference. But possibly one of the ways it makes a difference is actually in attracting great talent. In other words, it's the aggregation of great talent and the community you build around an accelerator that may be more important than any kind of process. So there isn't a magic selection process to pick out winners. And we can talk about that if you want. And there isn't a magic process for ensuring success either. So yeah, a lot learned and, and fascinating. I mean, I, I've really enjoyed the last 10 years of trying to figure out what do we do right? What do we do wrong? And I'm happy to chew that over with you if it's uh, the way you want to take this conversation. So what did you do right? I think we created a community. Instinctively, our urge was to bring people together. If you think of trying to get chemical reactions to happen, you kind of put some molecules in a box and shake it and try and bang them into each other. And I, looking back, I mean, yes, we ran seven accelerator cohorts with a 100-day program, typical textile type thing. But we also ran every Friday night 300, 300 open house events. And I know for a fact that something like 10,000 people met at those events. I know that two or three marriages <laughs> that occurred because of that. I think one of the things we always believed was that it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village to raise a startup. So I think we created a village. And I think communities are hard, right? Because there's a lot of ways to make it go wrong, to be honest. I don't know. It feels like everybody's trying to create a community as well. I think two years ago was the hardest thing, right? Everyone's talking about community building, community building. Mm. So what's your take on, I guess, the trend or why people get it right and why people get it wrong? I think it needs to be done out of authenticity for a start and trying to proactively build a community around a brand and put the brand at the center I think isn't going to work. I mean, one of the things that Meng and I explicitly did when we set up JFDI was to avoid having ourselves at the center of it. At one point, I think I was asked, I was nominated to be like Asian of the year or entrepreneur of the year or some bullshit. And I, I turned that down. I thought, no, that will be the kiss of death for this. I mean, number one, I don't deserve this. And number two, that will kind of set me up as some kind of guru in the middle of all of this. And that just isn't the case. It's the community that builds itself. And I think by you know, one of the things, the, one of the very first things Meng and I did was actually, you might find this bizarre. We went to the Wikipedia, uh, the Wikipedia page for religion, because we ended up thinking, well, what's, what's entrepreneurship closest to? It's like a faith, right? So what do all faiths have? And in the wiki, and we took the first sort of 200 words of the, the Wikipedia definition of a religion and broke it down into bits. And every religion has a kind of a weekly thing where you all get together. So we thought we have to have that. That's like our open house event. There's got to be some kind of initiation ceremony and there's got to be some kind of graduation thing. And there physically has to be some kind of a temple, synagogue, whatever. People have to, if you're trying to help people believe in the intangible, they are, it really helps to have a tangible place. And it was Meng that I have to give Meng full credit for this. He was very keen that we should have a very much a physical center. Even back then in 2011, 2012, people were saying, oh, this could all be virtual. You could meet about once a week or something and have dinner. I think that's what Paul Graham was doing at the time with Y Combinator. And our view was that, no, the ecosystem is too early for that here. There is not enough tacit knowledge in the air. There isn't enough structure in the community. We need at this time in the community's development to, to create a physical place where people come together. So to answer your question, I think authenticity and understanding the context in which you're operating. I mean, several times now I've written articles about, is there a universal formula for a good accelerator or venture builder or something like that? And I think the answer is no, there isn't. There probably isn't a universal formula for an ideal community either. It's very dependent on context, contingent, as the academics would say. And you, you mentioned about authenticity, right? And I think that's a tricky part for every community builder, right? Because the community is self-organized to some extent, obviously at a tribal level, right? Or family level. Mm. 
And then obviously, I think, like you mentioned, churches are authentic and they are built mm. around their faith. And obviously, there's a bunch of economics that go into it, right? Mm. They still have to pay rent and salaries and so, so forth. And they need volunteers. And I think there's this broader push, right? Corporate push to build communities, right? So around like Nike, right? Or Adidas or Reebok or Airbnb. Mm. So I think a lot of startups are really building this concept of community as a, and I've seen this, right? Unfair advantage as a competitive differentiation, right? So there's a bit of a, tool like adjunct to mm. it so i'm just curious about like how far can you push it how far can you build or do it in a way well i think if, for anyone who wants to build a community i'd advise them to look in great depth into the kind of anthropology about why communities come together classic example i was invited yesterday to become i think it's called nueva something like that it's a it's an independent search engine and they've just set up a sort of slack channel ta-da the community and the community manager wrote to me and said would i join it and I think it's quite a good product. So I said, sure, I'll log on. And I, and I went there and I thought, oh, why am I here? <laughs> I don't know. Okay, I'm not coming back. Nothing wrong. It's a great product, but there is no concept. There's no reason for me to be part of that community. On the other hand, I've, I've now got a little bit more time on my hands and I've been rediscovering a hobby from my teens. I, I used to be a radio hammer. I learned my Morse code when I was 14 years old. And the last few weeks, I've started building radios again and I built one yesterday. And I'm part of a community there, which is a bit like Stack Exchange. It's a sort of place where people who've got problems with the electronics they're building swap ideas. I came up with a block yesterday, posted something, and within two hours I had suggestions from around the world, which worked. So I think, so there, there's a reason for me to come together. So I think what community is not is it's not like a, a t-shirt that you can just drape over an old body and turn yourself into a supermodel. It's something that has to come, there has to be a reason. And in the case of when I knew that we, I'll tell you the story when I knew we got it right for JFDI, but basically... We used to have these open house events and one Friday I looked around and there was this Chinese uncle there about sort of 60 something. And he was looking a bit sad. And I said to him, Hey, what's, what's brought you along? Why are you here? And he almost with tears in his eyes, he said to me, I wish I'd had this. And he was looking around the room. I, I wish I'd had this. 30 years ago, when I set up my business, my father told me I would fail. My mother told me that only rich men start businesses. My brother told me, how can you be so selfish? When you fail, I will have to feed your children. It will be, bring shame on our family. But this, the guy's a multimillionaire. <laughs> and he said, I, I wish I'd had this. And I think so at that time, I'm not saying it would be right to do it that way or it would be the right thing to do now, but we very much didn't want to own that community. We just knew that as our entrepreneurs ourselves, it had been a very lonely experience at times and we wanted to bring people together. And there was a weird, there was another weird moment when I knew that we'd done the right thing. About 2015, there was this thing I was invited to at the Astana here, which is a presidential palace for those listening from overseas. And it was called the Founders Forum. And it had all of these people along there, politicians, investment bankers and whatever. And Meng and I were invited and we realized that there were no founders. <laughs> it, was all, it was all people like talking about entrepreneurship, not entrepreneurship. And the prime minister of Singapore stood up and he gave a speech and he told everyone about the Sudoku solving program that he'd written because he's actually a bit of a geek on the choir. He's a maths grad, people might know. And he talked about how he really enjoyed writing this piece of code. And Mang and I looked at each other and they all went in for dinner and, and Eduardo Savaran was the guest speaker. That's right. And we looked at each other and we said, we don't belong here, do we? This is, this is not our tribe. And we walked out as they have all the guests went into the Astana. We just thought, let's see if we can walk down through the ground, see if any of the security guards stop us. <laughs> And they didn't. So we walked right through the grounds. It was about a month after Lee Kuan Yew had passed away. And, and we were thinking to ourselves, well, Lee Kuan Yew must have walked here many times thinking about the ecosystem he was building, looking out over the city. And actually, maybe we've done our job. And at that time, I think we knew that it was it was time to bring the part, our part of the party to an end. And uh, it, it took another year to sort of wrap it up. But we, we stopped accelerating at the end of 2015, rather. But it was, a, yeah, it was a really interesting moment. We got down to the bottom of the Astana, walked by Plaza Singapore and waved at security guards and Nobody asked us what we were doing. We were just like, gone, siam. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I thought and it was that moment we thought it was actually that's our job here. You know, what's great now is you know, I mentor lots of fantastic students at NUS. I'm an entrepreneur in residence there. There's a whole generation of young entrepreneurs in Singapore who have no idea who we were or what we did. And I think that's fantastic. Wasn't looking to be a hero or a guru or anything out of this. I'm just really delighted to have seen the ecosystem grow. And of course, it didn't start with us. I've got to put in a name check here for Wong Po Cam and the folk who set up Bansi. You know, the, they are the grandparents of, of the startup ecosystem here in Singapore. Meng and I just happened to be, at that moment, contributors to it, along with many others. It was a very fun time. It was a party for five years, basically. 
Yeah, and you said something important, right? Which is about, do you belong to the tribe, right? Or do you not? And you shared that earlier on that you also have been reflecting on the things that you could have done better, right? How do you reflect on that? Poof. That's a really good question. I mean, when I look back on JFTI and knowing what I know now, I know what an accelerator is. And it's very interesting at the beginning of the, earlier on in this conversation, you kind of asked me, what were you building? What were you doing? One of the big questions for us in the first two years running JFTI is what is this accelerator thing? Is this, are we providing a service to investors? In which case, why aren't they paying us? Are we kind of creating deal flow for investors? Are we working for entrepreneurs? And I think the, the first generation of accelerators, that's a fundamental problem with the business model is it's not clear you're, you're actually a platform business is, is the way I would analyze it now. And of course, platforms were only emerging around this time, 10 years ago, the concept of what a platform business actually is and, and how its dynamics work. Every platform business has a core transaction so with ride sharing, hailing taxis, and it has a series of stakeholders around it. YouTube has a core transaction of uploading and, and downloading videos. In our case, the core transaction was the creation of investment readiness in, an, in a startup. And there were a group of interested stakeholders around that, about five or six different stakeholders, investors, the entrepreneurs themselves, our own staff, universities, or a bunch of different people around it. And the question is, it's very obvious. It, in fact, the academic research now shows that you create a lot of value as an accelerator if you do it well. The problem is how do you capture it? It's like one of those classic platform businesses where you're creating lots of value for people, but how are you actually capturing it to make yourself sustainable? So it's been interesting to see that evolve since. And I think some of the, if I was doing it all over again, so how would I say I would do it? If I was doing it all over again, I would number one, focus on one vertical because the hard part is not actually running the accelerator program. It's difficult to get great talent to apply and there's some organization involved in getting investment together and everything. But the hard part is when they graduate, can you actually get them to first revenue quickly? And if you're an accelerator that just offers sort of generic, get your act together as a startup sort of advice, that's okay. But what's great is if you can also get people first, first reference customers, stuff like that, particularly for deep tech companies, they really, really need that. So I think a, a sector specialism would really help. A second thing that would have really helped would be a more effective way of recycling talent that you put a lot of energy into getting to know people, seeing how they actually behave under pressure and everything. There was actually quite an efficient process happened in our startups that the startups that didn't get funded at the end of the accelerator ended up hiring the good people who hadn't got, sorry, the, ended up, the, the ones who didn't get funded ended up getting hired by the people who did. That was quite useful in, in the ecosystem at the time. But I think I would have a sex specialism and I would also have a much more rigorous direction to the whole thing. We, we ran a classic accelerator where you go out, ask for people to apply with their own ideas. If you know it, and if you do that inherently, you get a very diverse mix of people coming in. I think if we'd actually been more like a venture studio, that's what I would do now if I was doing it. So I basically say, we're going to have this industry focus. We're going to own, if not a majority, then a certainly a very significant chunk in each startup. I, you need to capture more value from the startups, basically. It's just not possible to, to run an accelerator in any sensible way when you're you're spending 60% of the money that you raise on costs. And everybody does that. If you look at the numbers from Techstars, you look at the numbers from 500 startups, whatever, everybody does that. It costs 60% of the money you raise because you're delivering intangibles, you're delivering training and education. You need to recoup that because only at the pre-seed stage, only one in 50 companies is going to be a real hit. So I, uh, and you, and you go into it. I mean, we should also talk about selection. So the biggest thing I would do overall, and we started to get this right by the end of the accelerator, is to get selection right. There was a period about two years in, I vividly remembered it. Sergei Netasin, one of the professors at, NU, at INSEAD, was very supportive of what we were doing. And I walked over to have a beer with him one evening, a bit depressed, because we put together this graph with kind of like the score we gave all the startups on the way in, and then kind of their success on the way out. And it was like this blizzard snowstorm, classic kind of zero correlation of thing. And I showed it to him and he pissed himself laughing. And he said, you know what? I did exactly the same thing for INSEAD's PhD recruitment last week. And he'd got exactly the same snowstorm. Again, score of the, of the committee on the way in and actually the performance as academic standard. And the two of us came to the conclusion that there was something in trying to find a selection process, a filter that magically would filter out the stars that we were fundamentally doing something wrong. And strangely, through a, through a bizarre coincidence, about a week later, I was at a dinner party and I ended up sitting opposite this guy who'd had the job of selecting Navy SEALs in the US. And I said to him, 
So like first day of basic military training, okay, you get these raw guys in, how do you figure out who's going to be the commandos, who's going to be the SEALs, right? And he said, well, the military learned hundreds of years ago, you can't do that. So what you actually have to do is you have to give people a series of experiences through which they self-select and through which they grow the psychological, physical, emotional, intellectual commitment to be a commando. So commandos are made by themselves and by their training. They're not born. Some people are born with a propensity for it, but they're not, they don't just emerge fully formed. So I think one of the things I learned there with an accelerator is that the fundamental idea of trying to sort of pick winners from the beginning is meaningless. And I think, again, the, if you look at the academic research, it's fascinating. There is no consistent journey. You must have seen this with your portfolios. There is no consistent journey from someone thinking, I want to be an entrepreneur or I want to do this idea to building a successful business. In fact, there's been some fascinating work done on these huge, what they call panel studies. So they, they basically randomly sample 10,000 people and then they come back a year later and they say, Hey guys, did you start a business? And obviously out of 10,000 people, then some people will have started a business. And what you find when you do those and you do some tests at each of the two stages, you find that quite a lot of people make the decision to become an entrepreneur and start a business before they found an opportunity. So the, the kind of the model that many people have in their head, the very sort of classic economic model that, well, entrepreneurs identify an opportunity and then they go and exploit it. You know, that, I mean, that might be true if you're digging up nuggets of gold. If you, if you know there's a nugget of gold under your feet, probably you go for it and dig it up, right? But a lot of the time, entrepreneurship happens because of a group of stakeholders who've come together. And I, I realize now, again, going back to community, that's to me why community is so important. You're, you are putting the molecules in a box and you're shaking it. And all around the world, I think that's been, across cultures, that's been shown to be the case. And of course, it's a bit of a problem for us here in Singapore, because here in Singapore, we like templates, we like work, we like structures, we like models and, and everything else. We like pipelines. That's why that we live in a wonderful, organized, clean, safe city. And that's not what entrepreneurship is about. Entrepreneurship is messy, disorganized, random, hit driven. You can nudge the odds in your favor, but it's always going to be a statistical thing, at least unless you guys, maybe you found the formula. What's it like at your firm? <laughs> Maybe you found the formula. No, I mean, it's tough, right? Exactly like you said. I think the easier part is that if they already raise a couple million dollars over two rounds, yeah. you know, they build yeah. a company, product market fit, yeah. then to some extent, there's more data in Correct. terms of picking, and then you're looking at the category. But I think, like you said, if you had a first round of funding as a accelerator, you have a bunch of people presenting themselves in the whole mm. of themselves, and that's it, right? Maybe some ideas or some early metrics, but... They yeah. said it's hard, right? Um, I mean, the analogy I gave to someone the other day was like, yeah. imagine, and I have several friends who've done this. Imagine you sort of set out and say, I am going to go and find myself a wife or a husband. And I want to optimize the parties I go to. So I'm only going to go to the parties where I think I'm going to meet like a husband or a wife. <laughs> and to some extent, that strategy works. But in terms of a lifelong commitment where you're unsure about where the thing's going to go, you you just can't optimize it like that. And, and the thing, the long discussions we had at JFDI were about the, the contrast between efficiency and effectiveness and early stage is not efficient. It's a bit like you go into a kindergarten and you think, well, why don't these kids just sit down and learn English and Chinese? Why don't they come out and in one year we could blitz them through, we could hothouse them through a process that would get them up to speed and then they'd be very successful in life. Well, you can do that, but then you end up kind of crippling them in all sorts of other ways and you end up by producing a uniform identikit set of, of hothoused kids who then have emotional problems later in life. And I think the same is true with startups. You look at corporates trying to sort of brew startups in a consistent way internally. It certainly doesn't work to put on t-shirts and eat pizza and, and rah, 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 let's all pretend to be startups for a day. That doesn't work. And it also doesn't work to try and take people who fundamentally have chosen to be employees and say magically, ta-da, you are now going to run your own businesses. That doesn't work either. So I think there is a, there is a challenge here with everyone trying to set up accelerators as the, you might think as the sort of decades gone by since we did our stuff. Oh, accelerators much, might be much more efficient now. Well, they're not. Actually, the, first of all, the ecosystem's changed. So what, what fits that ecosystem is totally different now than it was 10 years ago. And secondly, actually, the underlying processes of dealing with startups are like, it's like dealing with kids at kindergarten. And actually, there's something there. I don't know if I can take the conversation in a slightly different direction here. But one of the things that came out from me out of all of this was what the hell was this all about? Um, 
I actually started a PhD about two years ago. I'm looking at the process of the conversations that go on when companies pivot, because I saw that as being a critical moment for the startups that we deal with. You know, what is actually happening? Why, why did some of that work with JFDI? And out of my 30 years experience as an entrepreneur, why some of it worked and some of it bombed? And I'm pleased to say that there is no <laughs> great answer in the academic literature yet. And I'm also humble enough to say that I don't think I'm going to find that great answer. But I do think we're making progress. And the reason someone asked me the other day, so Hugh, it's very indulgent of you to do this PhD. It's a typical old man thing to do. And I, and I said to him, well, the thing is, I think that entrepreneurship is actually what we need to solve the difficult, wicked problems of climate change and all the other challenges that we face. That the, that the ability to deal with ambiguity and to create a desired result, despite the fact that you don't control the all the resources and you don't understand the future, that is entrepreneurship. If dealing with the future was like building another hotel or starting another legal firm, then you know, the MBAs would already have done it, but they can't, right? In fact, the MBAs have messed up the result. No disrespect to those excellent Harvard graduates like yourself, Jeremy, present company accepted. So I think we need a, an approach that's much more comfortable dealing with ambiguity, and that's what entrepreneurship is. So the analogy I would make is with the sort of electrical engineering industry in this in the 1850s, 1860s. At that time, people were kind of tinkering with electricity and they were starting to put lighting into people's houses and things, but it wasn't very good and the houses would burn down a lot of the time. <laughs> and then something happened between about 1870 and 1890. The electrical engineering industry became professionalized and suddenly there was a whole load of theory backing up the practice. And the tinkerer, look back at the literature, people doing telegraph and things, they really resented the professionalization of engineering. But as a result of that, we ended up with the 20th century and all the great things that, that the electrical engineering industry brought us. And I'm not saying that we should reduce entrepreneurship to a formula. I'm not saying that entrepreneurship will end up like electrical engineering. I think it will actually be much more like design. And that's another conversation we can have. But I do think we've, we're at a very interesting time when the importance of entrepreneurship has been realized its centrality to a more sustainable future is is fairly clear and we are starting to understand the kind of processes you, know, you asked me earlier what makes a community work I didn't give a terribly clear answer because we're still learning i certainly am but i'm fascinated by the fact that we are starting to make sense of it and i think that's something you're interested in too Definitely. I'm definitely interested in that, right? And it really resonates with me because medicine used to be for quackery, right? Right. <laughs> they, did a, they didn't they know They used what they to like sell. I mean, the definition mm. of snake oil salesman was because mm. they thought that the snake oil would make you healthy, right? And right. So doctor and snake oil is the same, right? Same with leaching and bloodletting and wow. oof, a lot uh, of stuff. And, and people that, would say, oh, this guy's a good doctor because he has a good bedside manner. He speaks well. And there's a fantastic book, by the way, if anyone has never read The Great Influenza, it's the sort of definitive history of the 1918 flu. I read it when I was in isolation as one of Singapore's first COVID victims. And it was fascinating because it's not really about the 1918 flu. It's really about the evolution of medicine between about 1890 and sort of 1930. It's really the story of some of the pioneers who were totally confused. What is this influenza thing that's killing millions of people? And of course, at that time, they didn't know about viruses. They knew about germs and they, and they were desperately looking for, well, where's the infectious agent that's causing this, this great influenza? And it was confusing because actually what would happen is people would get sick with a thing that we now know is a viral infection. And then they'd seem to recover. And then two weeks later, they'd die from a bacterial infection. And we now know that was a, that was a post-bacterial infection. And, and, and in fact, we could cure it nowadays, probably if the lung damage wasn't too bad. But it was fascinating to, to see that this has happened in other fields. And I'm, I'm in a very small way, your boss, Ong Peng Sin asked, why are you doing a PhD, Hugh? What's the point of that? And the answer is I'm, I'm fascinated to try and understand what is the basic process going on here? Why does this work? Why does this sometimes not work? So that's, yeah, starting to emerge. Yeah. And when I get the answer, I'm going to text you, okay? I'll put it in 140 <laughs> characters. <laughs> <laughs> I think they blew, exp expanded to 280. So ah, yeah, easy, to, easy. Yeah. Next yeah, year, then. easy, easy. Yeah. There we go. So on that note, could you share a, a, a time that you personally were brave? Yeah, I, I think my very first company, say, so was this TV production company. And like most entrepreneurs, I blundered into it. I was an entrepreneur by accident. I was a filmmaker first, making science films for Discovery, National Geographic, people like that, BBC. And in 2001, I'd allowed a situation to develop where 80% of our revenue came from Discovery Channel in the US. 
And for anyone who re was around at that time, they'll know that Discovery went from like two networks to 145 networks in, in three or four years, all on the back of .com 1.0 bullshit VC money. So all of those kind of stupid VC funded vehicles that were crazy at the time from .com 1, they all basically raised a load of VC money and then they spent it on TV advertising to try and get the clicks up because that's what people were measuring at the time. And then they went bust. And so the dot-com crash happened in, what was it? Was it April 2001? I think dot-com 1.0. <clears throat> and the NASDAQ just crashed in within a, like a week. And it took another two or three weeks for the same to happen in Britain. But anyway, as the NASDAQ crashed in the US, um, Discovery realized that their advertising revenue was also crashing. And they basically phoned me up and said, you know what? You know all those contracts we've got with you? Well, we're pulling them. And uh, you're a small firm in the UK and we're a large firm in the US. So... What are you going to do about it? Like swivel. So I always think of that as my MBA. And so thank you, Discovery, for teaching me that international contracts actually have absolutely zero meaning whatsoever. And it's only when you get paid money in the bank. That's what actually counts. So we nearly went bust. Everybody got paid. But it was the most stressful year of my life, I think, apart from becoming a dad. And I realized and I had to, I had to sack the whole staff. The minute they pulled the money, I knew that I had got a staff of 35 people. And I just said, guys, I'm so sorry. And there, and, you know, there were people whose wives were pregnant and stuff like that. And I realized now that part of being an entrepreneur is learning how to start businesses. And part of it is learning how to end businesses. There's a great writer on entrepreneurship called Sarah Sarasvathy. And she talks about entrepreneurship in terms of you being a pilot in a plane. You know, you're in control. And like pilots in a plane, you need to land the aircraft safely. If you're running out of fuel or an engine breaks or something like that, crashing the plane is not a good thing, right? And generally speaking, in a business, there is no reason to crash and burn, right? You need to minimize the collateral damage. So we used to run a session at JFDI actually on, on, on closing businesses. And it's, I think, for many entrepreneurs is the moment when you have to be most brave. You're coping with other people's emotions. You're coping with your own. I had to help a friend through this in November. He'd asked me to go and help him get his business ready to sell. When I looked at the books, I said, actually, I'm sorry, you're going to be insolvent in January. You need to lay off your staff this week. That was incredibly painful. If you're going to breed chickens, you need to learn how to, how to kill chickens. That's what the business is about. And, and, and business is the same. So yeah, I think I was taught to be brave about businesses, not heartless, but taught to be brave at that time so maybe actually the moment of bravery for me was not just closing that business it was actually getting back on the bike afterwards falling off the bike and i got back on and started my next business so uh, yeah maybe that was the moment I, i'd say that for anyone who's feeling vulnerable and alone my takeaway for you is don't be alone be part of a community find friends who you're not competing with find people who you can talk to who who know exactly what it's like and that means other entrepreneurs nobody else can tell you only other entrepreneurs and if you need to close a business, close it, close it with grace, try and help people move on, move on yourself. Don't get hung up on it. Very difficult to do with your first business, but, but essential if you want to actually help the world move on as well as yourself. So that's my, my story of bravery. You know, that's so true, right? And the tricky part, like you said, is that one out of 50 will be a hit, right? And you were talking about it from a selection of accelerated perspective, but from an individual founder perspective, yeah, yeah. totally. 50 or 50 feel invulnerable. Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, at the start of it, because I remember I felt, I was like, I was like, oh, I, I've heard about the odds. I was thinking to myself, I yeah, got an 80% yeah. chance of, of, of crushing nobody, it, even though I know it's 150. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody talks about the crap business that, that Bill Gates tried to start before he started Microsoft. Nobody talks about the total failure that Henry Ford had before he set up Ford Motor Company. And when you go to people's LinkedIn profiles, you find that all of those kind of shitty, stupid startup ideas <laughs> magically they're not there on the LinkedIn profile. People don't usually list those things, but that's when you learn. The universe has a harsh way, but also a very thorough way of teaching us. And you learn so much more when things don't work than when they do. And that's why I'm focusing on pivoting in my research. It seems to me the moment when truth emerges. And when you're sitting with a founder who's kind of like going through that tough time, right? And I think there's so many founders who are like, I mean, what needs to be done has to be done, but you know, he'll say like three months or six months when it's super confusing, right? Because you are, you're like, I think I got it. My investors tell me I kind of got it, but I'm not sure. And then, and it's kind of like really muddled, right? And really mm -hmm. gray. Yeah. You've been there too. So, yeah. yeah. So how do you sit true with the founder through the uncertainty? How do you coach them or how do you guide them through some of that thinking? So that actually is the subject of my... PhD research. That's why I started the PhD. Exactly that. Because I thought to myself, as a mentor here, I am in the, I'm not quite in the same situation as a psychotherapist where someone's 
sanity and mental health, but it is people's mental health, people's lives depend on this, people's marriages, people's relationships. Um, there's a short answer to it and a long answer to it. The short answer to it is that I think what we do as entrepreneurs is to try to control aspects of the world. We try to make the world the way we want it to be. And sometimes that involves conflicted objectives. So for example, if an investor is saying to you, hey, I want to see you actually generate some profit next quarter. And the investor is also saying, hey, I want to see you like boosting signups, right? The quickest way to boost signups is to reduce the price. Right? Simple economics tells us that. The simplest way to make more profit is to try and milk more money out of the customers, right? That you've already got. So those two things are in conflict. So if you're stuck at that level of thinking of those operational parameters, you can't reframe the business. And the key, I think, to going through a pivot, or all the research shows this, and I don't know if it resonates with your experience, is that reframing is, is, absolutely, is absolutely critical. I'm going to put something which our, our viewers on video will be able to enjoy. And for those of you listening in audio, I'll have to describe. So I'm holding up a pair of, I'm holding up a, a little box here. And I'm holding it sideways and it looks like a line looked at it from this dimension. Now that's, that's, it looks like a line, but if I look at it and I turn it through 90 degrees, now it looks like a rectangle, same box, but it's reframed. Right. And so I think the process that we go through, I think my theory that I'm trying to explore through my PhD is that when we are stuck on the level of operational activities or the, the immediate stuff that's in front of us, we can't see that big picture and reframe the business. And actually pivoting is all about reframing. And if there is no way to reframe the business, then the reframing is that now's a good time to close down and move on. You're still a talented person. You know, you've created some wealth. We've learned something here. Let's move on to the next one. But the key to it all is, is reframing what you're trying to understand what you're trying to control and trying to understand where that's in conflict and then reframing things to remove the conflict. I think that's at the heart of it. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing. I'd love to summarize the three big takeaways I got from this. First of all, I just really enjoyed the origin story of how you started and founded GFDI Accelerate all the way at the beginning, like you said, over 10 years ago, right at the start of the ecosystem. And I thought it was really interesting to hear the small details, right? Like you said, about the exact date that you launched during Chinese New Year for auspiciousness, all the way, I think, to the lessons that you learned, right? Along the way about what it means to build, to think about a business model and also some of the mistakes that you made, right? And that you learned from uh, over time. The second, of course, I really enjoyed was, I think really this, I don't know what you call it, counsel or advice. And I think you know, I can't summarize this, like, still just fucking do it, which is like, you know, about what it takes to build the perseverance that you need and how you exhibit it in your own life, but also the own personal stories of the hard decisions that founders have to make. For example, with starting businesses, with ending businesses, about communicating, about fundraising. And I thought there was a lot of tremendous amount of insight there. Lastly, I really enjoyed your point of view on choosing a tribe. And I think it was interesting because you talked about it two angles, right? The first, of course, is as a person who's joining a tribe from building radios, right? Versus joining other communities. But also you talked about it more explicitly from choosing your tribe from, you call it, I guess you would hate to call it top down, but maybe from the early builder perspective, right? In terms of like, is the value from the selection? Is the value from the scoring? Is the value from the curation? Is the value from the training? And I thought it was a really, I think, contrarian belief, to be honest, that you're saying that at the end of the day, is more about what you're forcing people to learn rather than uh, picking winners at this early stage. And I thought there was a good advice for community builders and for founders and for other folks in the ecosystem as well. So on that note, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Brave. If you enjoyed this episode, please share the podcast with your friends and colleagues. We would also appreciate you leaving a rating or review. Head over to www.bravesea.com for member content, resources, and community. Stay well and stay brave. Stay brave.